Welcome to another episode of What Do You Know with Joe, uh, first season episode of the new season. Super happy to have Jahan uh, Daravala with me. Jahan, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, no, we were chopping up a little bit before we got started. Uh, you're just kind of, you know, hanging with some friends right now, doing some hanging. You're, the season started, though, right? We're, we've kind of gotten started. We're just, you know, having a little bit of free time. Yes. Uh, so we had a busy month in January, but... Mm -hmm. uh, actually because the race got cancelled in hyderabad we have like over a, one month off before the next round in brazil nice. and i had to be home anyways to sort my visas out because having an indian passport i have to get visas for all of the countries that i'm, I'm racing in so gotcha. uh, sorting out all my visas before the rest of the season so yeah that's mainly why i'm back home i didn't even think about that honestly right like because technically like you're working in those countries right so you have to have like visas to like like drive there and do stuff like that right or like is that why you have to have all those visas yeah i mean even if i'm going to visit i have to have the visas so i just need the visas to get into the country yeah I, that makes sense I, I totally get that i didn't even think about that um and you know just to give you some background on our show so like you know, it's tr strictly educational from people who you know know a lot about formula racing to all the way in the end of the other spectrum where they're like i just want to learn um so really just excited to learn a lot about you how you kind of got involved and then uh, where you currently are today with uh, MSG and Maserati. So uh, let's kind of start from the top. Tell us a little about, you know, your childhood. What was it like uh, growing up, you know, sports, academics, things like that, family? Just love to, you know, get to know what it was like growing up. Yes, yeah, so I was uh, born and brought up in Mumbai in India. I studied here till like eighth or ninth, most of ninth grade. Uh, and that's, I was racing for around two years while I was still in Mumbai and in, and living here and going to school in India. Mm -hmm. But when I was uh, 11 or like yeah, 12 years old, uh, it was the Force India one in a billion hunt. And I was one of the three winners. So at that time, I had to race in UK and move abroad. So that's when things got super serious. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, my uh, GCSEs in the UK. Uh, and yeah, that's... I would say when my racing really got serious. So uh, I did all of my karting then in the UK and Europe. And then after that, I progressed, uh, you know, onto cars, did Formula Renault and Formula 3, Formula 2, and now mm -hmm. yeah, driving Maserati in, in Formula E. So yeah, I started racing when I was 10 years old. So around 15 years ago now. Yeah. And was it all like, was it all karting? Were you doing, like you mentioned, you were playing some paddle with some boys before. Like, is it, was it, was karting and racing your, your sport that you're like, I really like this? Or were you playing like other things? Uh, I play, in, usually I play a lot of sports anyways. Uh, you know, I love playing sports, but there was no real sport where I thought that I will make it my profession or my career. I actually just played uh, more for fun. Uh, well, with racing, it was pretty early on that, uh, firstly, I started when I was nine or 10. So it's considered late in, in motorsport. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, as soon as I did it, it, I knew it was kind of one thing I wanted to take super seriously and, and make it my, my career and profession. So yeah, I, I definitely play a lot of other sports, but there was no sport where I thought like I can do this for a living. So I would say mm -hmm. racing out in that perspective. Gotcha. And so, yeah, and you mentioned karting, right? You you were in UK doing all that. You know, tell us a little about like some of the, like the, I feel like a lot of, uh, and especially if people are new to the sport, they don't realize that a lot of, you know, drivers get their start. That's where they get their start with like Carlin and things like that. So, you know, what were, you know, when you were in karting, you know, tell us a little about that, but then also like, you know, what are some like top three skills or a couple skills where you were like, okay, this is, you know, you kind of honed in on them and they were things that you, you know, kind of taken to now even potentially like what, what in karting kind of also, you know, made you get elevated to the next level? I think uh, sports in general, but also racing, you know, there's so many ups and downs in this sport, especially mm -hmm. as, as, as like a racing driver, you know, you're competing against hundred people in, in, in every single go-kart race almost. So to be the sole winner is always difficult. You know, there are many yeah. races where you go through ups and downs. Uh, so that kind of that karting journey really prepares you for the future. Uh, you know, in the end, we're still driving a machine. So yeah. you can be race, you can have a mechanical failure or your tire come off. So mm -hmm. it's not all in your control. So you kind of learn things uh, from karting. I would say number one thing you learn is like your racecraft. Uh, 
the number two thing is like you learn to handle all the situations of racing like uh, all the all the ups and downs right. all all the emotions and like uh, number three is just uh, you know the art of the racing line the art of driving in the rain you know where the grip is where the grip is not uh, all these things you learn in karting you know there are exceptions of people who come straight to formula cars and and they and they do well but i would say most uh, formula 1 drivers most formula e drivers or most professional racing drivers mm-hmm. i would say 99% of them have a good karting background yeah 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 i agree um i spoke with another formula e racer um uh, and he you know similarly got a start in karting and it seems like that's something also a lot of people get their start in and like you said you should, like i think you hit the nail on the head there you're still driving machines right there are things that can happen so like that initial premise of you know it's just on a larger scale now but like that initial premise of that understanding um so you kind of started picking it up like pretty well you know you're carrying some hardware starting kind of jumping up through the tracks you know tell us a little about like um you know uh how that kind of got you to you know um you know the the reno 2.0 or renal 2.0 your formula 3 career tell us about the early entry into you know jumping from that karting car to the uh larger formula cars yeah, so yeah, most of my career in Europe in karting, I was with the Sarah Force India Academy at that point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was a changing point in my career to be part of that team. You know, Indian team in Formula One supporting uh, a young uh, driver in go karting. Mm-hmm. I always had like the the best equipment, the best coaches. You know, everything that everyone else also had to give me an equal opportunity to perform. Uh, at the end of my karting career, they mm-hmm. also bought me and they supported me. So I went from karting into Formula Renault. It was a pretty big jump. Yeah. Uh, most people nowadays, the kind of normal path is to go from karting to Formula Four, and then three, two, one, or Formula E. So it's more structured. Let's say in the last four or five years, it's changed the structure. Not too many people go down the. Some do to the Renault route, but most people start their careers in Formula 4 now. It's very mm-hmm. rare to get to Formula Renault or Formula 3. Yeah. Uh, I kind of did Formula Renault for a couple of years. Uh, I did Formula 3 for two years. Uh, that was the time that uh, Force India then uh, no longer had a team. So I was an independent driver in Formula 3 in 2019. Uh, I drove for Prema and was fighting mm-hmm. for the the entire season. And uh, that's the year that Red Bull like saw some talent and potential in me, and I yeah. then became a Red Bull Junior in the beginning of 2020, and uh, was with them for uh, my first three years of Formula Two. Uh, and yeah, now I'm in obviously in Formula E, the only rookie on the grid this year, and yeah, to drive for Maserati MSG Racing uh, in my rookie on Formula E is uh, a huge privilege mm-hmm. because. Uh, they are they are a team which already has success and uh, to be in a competitive car in your in your first season is is something really to be grateful for. i agree i agree and also kudos to you that's a huge accomplishment and i think you know i just if anyone's just taking even a glance at your career you know i wouldn't be surprised you know and how, how much more you're going to jump and quickly keep going and we're going to allude to that a little bit later but you mentioned a little bit about uh you know your red bull team um, and, you know, your beginnings in the, you know, F3 career, you know, tell us about some of your top moments, uh, even if it was that and maybe what it was like, you know, stepping on that podium for the first time. Um, you know, I know, especially and and you kind of alluded to in 2020, I can't imagine what like, especially when, you know, the pandemic happened and all that. That's another you know variable into the situation. Walk us through some of those moments of, you know, not only starting in 2020, right, you know, being being, you know, top moments up in your career but then also like what it was kind of like racing during the pandemic yeah so yeah i would say like initially just being part of the force india driver academy was uh, a big highlight for me then uh you know winning the british karting championship in 2013 standing on the world championship podium being yeah. the only so in 2014 uh then yeah i had a successful year in formula Renault. uh yeah, I won races in Formula 3. I was fighting for the championship in Formula 3 uh, and signing for Red Bull for Formula 2. And I would say in 2020, winning my first race in Formula 2 and hearing the national anthem uh, on the cool. board. Yeah, it was really cool. So I, I would say these moments you never forget uh, yeah. in, in, your, in your kind of journey and in your career. And especially 2020, like uh, 
you know, in the pandemic, it was super difficult. I mean, in a way, it was. Yeah, obviously the pandemic was super bad for everything that happened, but in a way it worked out for me better because mm -hmm. I had just injured my knee playing football. I tore my ACL, MCL, and meniscus like just a couple of months before the season started. Oh, so I had uh, two or three months extra to recover before the season. I, w I mean, I was anyways gonna drive. I did the testing. I couldn't even walk, and I was still like driving the car. Man. But yeah, definitely helpful to be had those couple of months you know to be home with my friends my family uh to be able to yeah, hit my like the rehab and all the stuff i had to do at home to completely get ready for the season but it was a unfortunate but a blessing in disguise for me in a way that i was fully ready and fit for my for my first season with red bull in 2020 mm -hmm. and yeah, that season was super hectic you know because everything got delayed and then we crammed uh, the whole season in just a couple of months so yeah, it was a, it's a year I won't forget, especially, you know, with the pandemic, signing for Red Bull and then also my first win yeah, in Formula 2. So that's got to, uh, like you said, that's got to uh, be crazy to be like on the podium, hearing your national anthem, like at eyes on you, just kind of like that's got to be just one of the coolest moments. Like that's just got to be something different that you once in a lifetime kind of experience. Yeah, definitely. It's, it was super cool. Also, uh, most of the year, you know, uh, because of the pandemic, I didn't have my family around yeah. for any of the, the moments or the races. It was super difficult year for me as well. And yeah, my family couldn't be there. Uh, but uh, it was the first weekend my father attended. And then, yeah, I was on the podium and then I won a race. So that That's was cool. uh, awesome as well. And uh, yeah. Kind of like had, also like solidification that all this hard work is paying off. You're getting up on the podium. You're working your butt off, and you know you you you. It's there's the reward now too a little bit too. I mean, even if you know at the end of the day, like if you guys were if you were especially like finishing like you know you you worked so hard your whole career. The fact that you know even coming in top you know placing is crazy, but to get on top of the podium when win a race is is something else. Um. So how did you, you know, initially, especially, how did you learn about Formula E, Formula E and like, how, like, I feel like, especially over the past couple of years, that's just quickly started getting up, especially with like the push for electric cars and things like that. How did you kind of first hear about that and what made you kind of interested in it? Yeah, so honestly, as a kid, uh, yeah, my childhood dream was always to drive in, in Formula One, uh, you know, but as I grew up and I kind of was in Formula Two, so close to Formula One. You know, it's even difficult when you're winning in Formula 2 to go to Formula 1. So, you know, I I quickly realized that, you know, it's, there's an outside chance to go, but there are more opportunities outside of Formula 1. Uh, you know, if I didn't take these opportunities, I don't know when I would get them again. Uh, and Formula E for me is the fastest growing motorsport yeah. in the world now. Uh, and uh, not in a, like, a, I don't know. I, I would say like the level, the average level of Formula E drivers is probably like quite close to Formula One in terms of obviously you have a lot of like, yeah, obviously you have the Verstappens, the Leclerc's, the Hamiltons, mm -hmm. the Norris, Formula One, but like just the average, like if if I would take any of the 20 drivers in Formula E to be my teammate in Formula Two, I would know I'm in for a tough season. So you have like wow, 22 drivers on the grid who can win races and who are super fast and mm -hmm. and so yeah i would say it's one of the most competitive championships uh, in the world as well because everyone almost has the same cars so yeah, yeah uh, drivers can really make a difference as well so i think uh yeah like i said i always wanted to go to formula one but uh, i'm super happy to be in formula e uh you know it's not easy it's mm -hmm. super difficult so i still need to have a good season good results to to make sure i can keep this as my my career for the next few years at least yeah, and, and to your point too, I mean, it's almost like, you know, I think every driver has kind of had it, but you've, your your resume, so to speak, of like different kind of cars you've driven is like completely like driving, you know, all the way from a beginning karting car. I know that like in each, for, and for people who don't know, the same car that they're driving in Formula 1 isn't the same one that they're driving in Formula 3 or even, I mean, obviously Formula E too, but like the car sizes, the engines, things like that, like even potentially the tires are different, like you've driven so many different cars and like you've you know like and you have that you know you know um you know what's the word i'm looking for essentially you just have all that knowledge about how the different cars work so like if anything you know you you 
you've adapted to a lot of different situations that, which I think is like you said, says a lot about a formula E racer because they're able to adapt. And I, I mean, you also look at the, the sponsors of a lot. I mean, obviously uh, MSG and um, uh, Maserati, but you have like some Porsche teams coming in there Andretti. Um, you, you, you have a lot of good sponsors. Um, putting money into formula E, like you said, that I think it's going to keep growing. And, uh, it's, it's definitely something that's crazy to see how quickly it's grown. Um, but yeah, no, uh, tell us a little about the Maserati team. What are you looking forward to throughout the season? Uh, present day, here we are. Um, Maserati MSG is a great team. Uh, tell us a little about, you know, how it's going. Yes. Uh, you know, towards the end of last year, when I knew I was going to drive for them, I kind of, uh, yeah, quickly went to Monaco to get associated with the team. That's where they are based. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, just uh, to drive for Maserati MSG Racing is, uh, like I said earlier, a huge privilege. You know, they're uh, a luxury brand, and to be here in my rookie season is, is yeah, uh, really awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I've had a, I have a great relationship with uh, you know all of the guys and girls in our team. Uh, you know, I have a great bunch of engineers, great crew great mechanics and we always have one goal you know we are pushing our best every weekend not only at the track but also at us at the simulator at the office you know trying to extract every small bit of performance to yeah. yeah to try to maximize the you know our potential so it's been great you know obviously the results haven't been uh, fantastic as of yet uh, you know i could have been in the points in in, in diria but we had uh, an issue on on the brakes uh, yeah, so now I'm looking forward to, you know, the rest of the season. I'm sure yeah. it's going to be fun, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to getting some good results and, and yeah, uh, doing well for the team. It's a long season. You know, you guys, are, you guys are just starting, you know, early on. So you got a long way. They were rooting for you for sure. Um, love to also now get you before we jump into, you know, what I'd love to ask more about. But um, you mentioned Monaco and you mentioned these these courses. And to your point before about, you know, formula e getting a lot of money and these teams joining in um you know what do you think that means longevity of the sport in the terms of like car sizes things like that you know as more teams and more sponsors and everyone gets involved you have more cars on the track that makes it harder you know these cars are already so large it's it's definitely and you have these tracks that are historical but maybe not built so much for it you know do you see potentially consolidations of teams or like with more teams like car sizes even getting even further changed like tell me a little bit about what your perspective is about the growth of the sport where it's going and you know how that plays into also the logistics of the sport yes i think you know the, the sport is growing super quickly if you see where they've come from season one to now season 10 you know they've come a long way especially with the cars with with the teams but also the fan base is growing uh year to year you know the fans know the drivers from the past they know how good all the drivers are so uh the drivers and as well teams like porsche mclaren maserati you know all of these big brands being in formula e really helps the, the championship uh, and as well in the future the cars are just going to get faster and, and and better and more efficient you know, you know i'm not going to be surprised in the next two years if we do uh zero to 100 in less than two seconds i think yeah. it's a it's a huge possibility especially with four wheel drive uh coming wow. in in the near future so yeah i think there's a lot of technology uh which is still to be improved and to be developed but uh you know things are moving super quickly so in even in the next three or four years from now i think these cars will be much bigger much faster driving on bigger racetracks and uh, mm -hmm. even more entertaining for the fans i agree i agree and i think Right. That's the that's the biggest thing. You have a lot of people with eyes on it now. I think situations like Drive to Survive and things like that are just going to continue to grow recognition to the sport. But it also gives drivers the opportunity to gain more recognition and, you know, grow as a whole. Um, and I, I think, you know, that was something else I was th talking with someone this past week about just, you know, you, you kind of said it a little bit, right? Like money, like there's cars are going to get faster. People are going to throw more money at this. You're going to have more teams want to get involved. Um, the the it, It's going to keep growing. Um, so especially when it comes to like, do you see um, with that as well, other cities and other places trying to get more tracks and trying to get more locations for racing? Like, do you think, you know, especially you mentioned Monaco and there's always going to be the top locations, but do you think you're going to continue to see more evolution into where these races are going to go? Yeah, I would say yes. I think, you know, already Formula E goes to some very big cities. 
also kind of now uh, the informally they're trying to race in the heart of the city so in the streets you know in all of these tracks so that is their main uh, idea right now but obviously as the cars get bigger and faster even if you drive on the streets you need a bit bigger ones you know uh, yeah right i think honestly in the next uh, yeah couple of years you're going to have some really cool races uh, coming onto the calendar and i yeah see why not uh, you know big cities like new york and stuff can also come back uh, yeah so i mean i don't know too much on that side as as a driver i just leave that up to formula e in the, right right place. exactly it's, we're just there to drive to work with the team and to do the best results and uh, we don't choose where, where we are I'm, driving. yeah i'm sure fia is not like hey john yeah. if you had to pick top five places you'd like to drive where would that be they don't you know they're not going to do that but it is you know i think that is part of the balance right they do it any extent they should listen to the drivers and what the feedback they get there um you mentioned you know formula one right you you you've had a little taste doing some like um testings and things like that for mclaren a few others is is that still on your map right is that is that something that you're like hey i mean i'm still striving to get there i'm you know that's something you want to potentially look at down the road whether that's you know i, I again i can see maserati msg you know growing like crazy but i could also see you know they've got the money if they do successful if you guys win and do things i could see them having a team there like is that something you've still potentially thought about or you know is that something right now you're just focusing on maserati i mean honestly being in motorsport and knowing everything that i know and in the market you know i would say getting a formula one seat is so difficult right now you know even even winning a formula two championship yeah sometimes not enough if you see the last two champions are not in formula one so sometimes things are completely out of your control uh, mm -hmm. if champions do not be in f1 it's how difficult it is uh so right now my, my whole like focus my whole attention is all on formula e you know that's why i'm focusing i'm trying to make my future in formula e uh but you know yeah, who knows uh, what happens in the future you know if i'm not in formula e if there's an opportunity in formula one no one is going to say no so uh sure. you know you would, uh, you would take it so yeah in the end uh, like i said realistically it's not something that i'm i'm looking at right now uh you know i know where my 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 priority lies and where my future is right now and it's looking uh more and more like formula e. yeah no and hey i i think you know, like you said formula e i think what was it last year or i think it was last year or a few years ago they were in brooklyn i mean like those especially with the the craze and the the popularity around electric cars and things like that initially like formula e sticks out to me as like something to be like i'd be interested in that right like i i'd be and especially when you get the cool sponsors around them too i don't think it's something that you know i think i i think and a, a lot of people probably you know don't you know either see it this way or they do but like you guys are racing just as hard you guys are putting just as much effort in. you're putting in all the same hours it's it's the same level of competition it's it's just on a different car a different form but um no, I agree. I think you guys are crushing it. And I also think that, you know, even as the sport grows even more, you're going to be seeing more and more, you know, formula races on streaming services, ESPN, you know, your, your sky sports, things like that. So I think it's, you know, something that's growing. So John, I really appreciate, you know, you taking the time to dive in all this. I love that you got to share your growing, your come up, um, you know, for anyone listening and whoever's, you know, interested in formula, feel free to, you know, tune into these. Uh, last bit of question. Uh, I always like to throw this, and I've asked this to everyone. Like I've asked this to pro football players. I've asked this to like interior designers. It's just a fun question, just because like you know you don't think, and it's just interesting. And you can't you can't use your car because that'd be cheating. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with the movie Step Brothers in America uh, with like uh, Will Ferrell and yeah, I, like the, I think I'm older. Yeah. Well, so in that gotcha, gotcha. So in that movie. Like, and it's a, it's definitely a, a you know, it, this could be an interview question for sure. Uh, in that movie, there's a scene where they have to like fight a ton of fifth graders. I'm curious, like in your situation, um, how many fifth graders do you think you could fight before they overpower you or before, you know, they like, you know, I mean, especially in today's day and age, fifth graders are built different. They're a little bit bigger. Um, so I, love to like, know if, if they, if it was a, like, if I had to, like push them away in a physical fight you mean? oh yeah they're they're coming they're coming for you Jahan. they're coming for they're coming for you and they're not holding back so you've gotta 
and it's just an endless stream of them, right? They're just there's a ton of them. Um, so yeah, I'm I so curious to know how many you think you can take over. I think I can confidently say fifty. Okay, fifty. I mean, if you can a little bit, tell us. I mean, tell us a little about that. You know, is it because I mean, I would say you guys put your bodies through so much. You probably train really well, so I I can see that. But fifty is a good number. I respect that. I respect fifty. Yeah, I would say yeah, if I'm, you know, well, oh, I think, like, I know how I was when I was in the fifth grade. I was pretty <laughs> lanky. <laughs> right, right. Good point. I mean, I've not met too many American fifth graders. Maybe they are, like, oh, yeah, maybe stronger than I was when I was in the fifth <laughs> But uh, I think I'm just saying this because I've seen, like, uh, I've seen a football match. Where two yeah. professional players play against a hundred school kids and they beat them, so I'm thinking like, why not fifty against? I, I I see I I kind of follow similarly to that because you know at, at the end of the day they're sure fifth graders might be I've seen some fifth graders in America where it's like okay I can't believe you're in fifth grade but at the end of the day they're still fifth grader right you take that one out there's still fifty other lanky ones who you know aren't you know gonna be able to put up as much. Um, and to your point, you know, there's, it's a, it's a psychological thing too. You know, this fifth grader sees you taking down 25 other ones. That's like, crap, am I going to be able to take this kid down or this guy down? Probably not. So, um, no, I appreciate your insight there. It's just a fun question. I love asking everyone. It's different. Throws off the whole, you know, educational thing. It's still learning. You still learn that some people, you know, can, can take down a good mess of fifth graders. So I appreciate that. What's um, the higher huh? Well, What's so I had, he's a, he's a professional, he was a professional football player and um in the states he's retired now but he was like i'm taking like i was like i gave him the same thing and he's like i'm taking down all of them and i was like you're gonna take down over like 100 fifth graders he's like yeah i'm taking out all those kids and i'm like and he was getting deep in it too he was like i mean i'm gonna make them know their parents could be right there i don't give a damn i'm taking down all these kids so like i've heard all the way from like over 100 to 50 and then i've had like there's a um a university basketball coach um that i spoke to and he had seen the movie and he was like, you know, there's also a scene in the movie where he's like, I'm going to take a different. He's like, I'm just going to avoid that situation as a whole, which I think he was sitting on the fence. He's like, I can't really come out and say as a college coach, like, I'm going to beat up a bunch of kids. But like at the same time, too, I was like, you know, I want to know how many you can take down. So I've heard a wide range. I personally, in my current state, I could I'm, I'm confident with a little over 20. But, you know, I similar to you, I we so I had a torn ACL. Um and partially torn meniscus back when I was younger and now being a little bit older, you know, if they hit that weak spot, I don't know what could happen, man. I don't know. I, I, I hope, uh, you know, I hope they don't find that weakness, but you know, I like to think I'm in the 20 range. Yeah. But... It's tough. It's tough. But before I let you go, man, again, I really appreciate your time before I let you go. Is there anything else, um, you know, you wanted to share? Is there anything else, you know, you would want to share on like formula racing to someone who just wouldn't know or anything like that? No, I think I'm pretty happy. I think we covered everything uh, that, yeah, you wondered if there's anything else. Yeah, you can let me know. Yeah, no, absolutely. And again, you're thank you for coming on the show. You're and any anyone who comes on the show, we're a fan of the pod, fan of them. Uh, we're going to be rooting for you. If anybody ever asks, they're like, hey, who are you rooting for? Um, you know, I'm pulling for Jahan and Maserati for sure. You know, oh, that's what I wanted to ask you, low key. Um, and again, it's sorry, side sidebar question. And if it's cool, if you can't answer it, um, you always see it in formula for like, and for those who have seen it, I've had people, you know, you always see like these formula drivers, you know, if they're on the team, right. They like, for instance, you see for seven, he gets a Honda civic. You see, you know, uh, when he was on the team, he, he's coming up in McLaren. Did Maserati hook you up with the Maserati? What are you driving? Can we know? Yeah, it's got a, in Monaco, I have this Maserati Grecali, but um, I'm in the next couple of months. I get, uh, yeah, the, Gran Turismo electric one. So let's see. That's so sick. Oh, that's tight. Oh, that's awesome. I'm glad to hear. And I mean, deservingly so. You know, you should get one, but that's that's awesome. I'm sure those are fun to drive. Very jealous. Had to ask that in there real quick. That's that's awesome. Well, Jahan, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Go enjoy your free time. We'll be rooting for you this season. And uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, man. You have a good